Oh, good morning, friends. Welcome to Christ the King. My name is Eric Nelson. I'm the Children and Family Outreach Minister here, and we have a few brief announcements. First of all, uh, we played hard at day camp uh, this past week, and I forgot I'm in my 40s. So, uh, so Friday at Water Day, I blew up my knee, and uh, so your prayers for healing with that would be appreciated. And I'm getting a sweat by it with crutches. I had never realized that. So um, just one real brief, uh, uh, well, they're kind of tied together. Two brief announcements. One, if you came in through our 17th Street entrance, you would have seen the tree, the apple tree. Uh, it's a little uh, tree with apple ornaments. These are um, dollar values for items that teachers at Lakes Middle School have requested. Uh, the extra things for their classrooms to help with their teaching, to help make it a better learning environment. And they're expensive. And this is an opportunity that as a church we get to come alongside those teachers and say, hey, we love you because Jesus loves us and we're going to support you. So they've filled out some requests. Our LWML has come together and put those together, put dollar amounts on. There were some big ticket items that were in the e-news this past week. If you would like to take a look at that and uh, if you know somebody who has a used item, I think there was a, a, a couch or some seats and stuff. There's a, there was a number of them, so take a look at the, the e-news. If you have any access to that, go ahead and call the number that's listed there, and we can arrange pickup. Otherwise, you can grab an ornament and uh, uh, that has a dollar amount, donate to that, and they'll do the shopping. It's, it's a new month, so it's also a new month for the shoe boxes, which is a, another circle of our LWML is organizing. So if you want to take a look, look at that, a similar thing, grab a, a sticky note that has a dollar amount and uh, to donate or donate the items, and there's a box to put that in there. So with that, welcome to worship. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. Welcome to our members and to our guests and our visitors and visiting from all over the country, some folks from Kansas here this morning. Glad to have you and welcome to our folks who are joining us online. We pray that you will be blessed uh, by your presence here and that the Holy Spirit will be among us as we uh, prepare for worship. I, my name is Mike Haas. I'm the Executive Director of Ministries and Deacon here at Christ the King. And this morning, Pastor Larry Comer and myself will be bringing God's Word to you, leading you in worship. And together we will prepare ourselves to receive the Lord's Supper. So we are looking forward to that. A couple of uh, quick updates. As you know, Pastor John, Julie, and the family are kind of on a mini sabbatical right now. Uh, they're over in Poland in their old stomping grounds, their old mission, their old mission grounds. And Things are going well. I've seen pictures of the kids, and they just look like they're having a great time. So we'll keep them in our prayers, and please keep them in your prayers and that their travels uh, will be blessed and their travels will be safe. Let's see. <clears throat> VBS just finished up this week, the day camp that Luther Haven came and did here. So we had crazy kids running all over this building Monday through Friday, which was a joy to see. And then Friday night, at the conclusion, we had over in the field a uh, barbecue, and we had uh, Caden and the marimba band out there, and then we had our first Friday night movie out there. And I think together, there was a couple hundred folks gathered together out there, lots of kids, lots of folks from the neighborhood, and it was a wonderful time. And many thanks to all who helped put that together. It was just, just terrific. I also got a note <coughs> from Jeff Arthurs, who's our our other uh, deacon that serves for us in the Silver Valley at Bethany over there in Osborne, uh, Friday they had a second harvest uh, food distribution. And Jeff said that they served over 275 families on Friday in the valley, which is very impressive. So we are grateful for that and for the ministry they continue to provide uh, for the Silver Valley. Okay. I'm going to uh, say something to you, see if this rings a bell. Well, hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. I wish you a very pleasant afternoon wherever you may be. Do those words mean anything to you? Well, hi, everybody. 
and a very pleasant afternoon to you wherever you may be. I first heard those words in 1958. They were the first words that I heard on the radio from Vince Scully, the announcer of the Dodgers, and listened to that ever since. Oh, Vin passed away this week. Wonderful man, greatest broadcaster in baseball, and also a very devout Christian. Really good man. Uh, so we miss his passing, but in baseball, <clears throat> you know what the month of August is called in baseball? Anybody know what the month of August is called in baseball? It's the dog days of summer. August is the dog days of summer, and that's because at the very beginning of August, there's all this trading that goes on and, you know, trying to prepare yourself for the playoffs and get ready for the fall. I mentioned that just because that's what we're doing here at Christ the King right now. It's August. It's the dog days of summer at Christ the King in August, and we're doing that same planning for the fall. We're getting ready for new missions, for new ministries, um, for new outreach, and so we're doing pretty much the same thing. So look forward to that come September. So with that, folks, I welcome you. I'm glad to be with you this morning. Pray God's blessings on you as we worship together. So shall Alaska. we rise? Oh, I'm sorry. Alaska. I got one more. forgot one more thing, Larry. Thank you. One more thing. Next weekend uh, will be our weekend for Alaska Mission for Christ. We're going to be focusing on our Alaska missions from our mission trips. Our brother, uh, Russ Schumacher, and I are going to be making a presentation Saturday night at 4 before <laughs> worship, and then also between services at the Bible study hour at 10 o'clock. There'll be a, about a 45-minute presentation where Russ will get in detail about our Alaska mission for Christ. And it's the uh, parable we picked for next weekend is the parable of the wise and the unwise builders. And I can tell you that the men that have been going up to Alaska for the last 10 or 12 years are the wise builders. And we're going to show you pictures of proof. So next week, Alaska Mission for Christ. So let's stand as we begin our worship. gather to worship our one true triune God by his name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment of silent prayer and confession.
Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die and rise again for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore announce to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it's by your grace that we live as your people who offer here our acceptable service and praise. Grant that we may walk by faith and not by sight in the way that leads us to eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our lessons. Thank you, Todd, for being our reader this morning. And our Old Testament lesson this morning is from Proverbs chapter 2. 
And this talks about the value of wisdom and the fear of the Lord. The search for wisdom is a lifelong journey. And wisdom remains hidden from those who do not seek it by prayer or by faith. Here in Proverbs, the term fear is not being afraid like Jacob was afraid to meet his brother Esau. It's different than that. Here it is one of reverence and respect. True wisdom, true wisdom begins with this kind of fear. God promises to give understanding and knowledge to those who revere him as God and his Father. The Old Testament reading is from the second chapter of Proverbs. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the ways of his saints. This is the, way, the word of the Lord. Be Our epistle lesson today comes for us from Philippians chapter 3. And the question is asked, for the sake of Christ, what are we willing to lose? For the sake of Christ, what are you and I willing to lose? Paul says his loss, the loss of everything, turns to gain, and that, that he might gain Christ and live in real life a faith rooted in our baptisms and in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The epistle is from the third chapter of Philippians. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Todd. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 44th chapter. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. I invite you to be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, 651, I Love Your Kingdom, Lord.
very blessed good morning once again uh, to all of you. And uh, we have been going through this summer uh, now, looking at the stories that change the world, the stories of the parables of Jesus. And today we continue uh, that focus, looking at two parables, the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great price. Matthew chapter 13 contains seven of these parables of Jesus. They, it contains the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, <clears throat> the parable of the mustard seed, German mustard, by the way, <clears throat> and the leaven, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, and the parable of the net. And those last four are found only in Matthew's gospel, which is interesting. And I also find it interesting as we look at these two parables today that it is Matthew who is the writer, the Holy Spirit-inspired author and writer of these two parables. Because we all know what Matthew's job was. He was the tax collector. He was not well-liked, not the nicest guy in town. People hated to do business with him. But as a tax collector, his position brought him great wealth and great power, and he often dealt with merchants and traders and hidden treasures and objects of great price and value. And so when Matthew heard these stories, heard these parables from Jesus, they resonated with him, and he knew their value, and he had, and he had to write them down. He had to write them down. So today we're going to focus on those two, those two short parables and these two short parables combined contain less than 70 words between the two of them. So my message this morning is only going to be seven minutes long, okay? And all of God's people said? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. But let's take a look at those words again from Matthew 13, 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid everything again. And then in his joy, and I want you to remember that, in his joy, in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There are 55 of these parables throughout Scripture, and uh, that seems to be a lot. What is it with all these parables? What are they trying to say, and what is their purpose? And why does on some Jesus speak very clearly, and on others he doesn't? You see, we have the parables of the sower and the weeds where he gives us the explanation, a detailed explanation of the meaning of these. He also does with the story of the Good Samaritan where he tells us who our neighbor is and how that we should love our neighbor. But then there are others not quite so clear. Others don't give us exactly what we're looking for right up front. Sometimes we just want to know what the answer is. <laughs> Okay? I put this up because my mother was passionate about Jeopardy. Day and night, seven days a week, she watched Jeopardy, and she couldn't wait for Alex to say those words, and the answer is, and then it came up, and of course they had to guess the question. But we, we kind of know what the answer is, or where the answer is heading, don't we? We kind of have a pretty good feel for that. And in the early parts of Matthew 13, Jesus really tells us, what the purpose of these parables is. He really tells us about the meaning of these parables in his own words. And so I'd like to read to you this morning, right at that Matthew 13, verses 10 uh, through 17, where he tells us, okay? So then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. And remember those words as well, because we're going to talk about those secrets a little bit later. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. 
but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive, for this people's heart is grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have been closed, lest they should see with their own eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, that I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people belong to me, belong to see what you see, and did not see it, and hear what you hear, and did not hear it. See, parables both reveal and conceal, and for unbelievers, unbelievers, parallels are kind of a form of God's judgment because they refuse to listen. You see, not everyone who heard Jesus believed, even those that were right there at his feet, not everyone believed. There were the critics, the skeptics, there were the doubters, and then there were those who became his enemies. Here Jesus, speaking to his disciples, declares them blessed because they have seen and they have heard and they believe. You and I are also blessed. You and I are also blessed because we have been given those same gifts by the Holy Spirit, eyes to see and ears to hear. And we should never, ever take those blessings for granted. So as we move through our uh, message today, we're going to focus on these three keys, the treasure, the pearl, and the kingdom. And there are many different interpretations of these uh, two parables. What do the treasures represent? Who is the man and who bought the field and the one who purchased the pearl? And there are some who believe that this is a story about the cost of discipleship or about the cost of, of following Jesus. But I believe that a more Christological interpretation one that focuses on the nature and the work of Jesus in these parables best defines the two of them. And if you'll recall, we've talked about this many times over the years about the purpose of Scripture and that the purpose of the Old Testament was to lead God's people toward Jesus, towards the coming Messiah, and that the purpose of the New Testament is always to bring us back to Jesus and back to his cost his cross. So all of Scripture brings us to Jesus. Okay. All of Scripture. And there is a common theme that runs between these two. The meaning of these two parables is essentially the same. There's a valued object that someone buys or bought or purchased. And remember that word purchased. At a cost of everything he possesses. Again, this key language used in here is purchased, redeemed, and won. And we'll get into those in more detail. But this is not, folks, about selling everything you have. This is not about giving up all that you have. It's not about buying your way into the kingdom. It is rather, rather about the priorities in our lives, about our priorities in our lives, and not getting preoccupied with the things of this life and neglecting our eternal well-being. So the treasure. You know, there are so many stories about hidden treasure in Idaho. It's pretty overwhelming. I just grabbed a few, but there are, there are hundreds. So here's just a few. In 1863, a man named Ed Long, along with his partner, stole almost $100,000 in gold dust and nuggets from a stagecoach down in Port Neff Canyon in eastern Idaho. It is said to be buried somewhere along the Idaho-Utah border. It's still there. Buried near Goose Creek, which is uh, north of the city of, uh, of Rocks near Twin Falls, it is said to be buried over $200,000 in gold bullion. Uh, hidden at Robber's Roost, which is near McCammon in Bannock County, supposed to be over 300 pounds of gold laying in the ground there somewhere. And then there's a story about lost diamonds 
This story goes that somewhere between McCall and New Meadows on your way to Boise is rumored to be two full bushels of uncut diamonds somewhere in the ground, under a tree, in a foxhole, who knows. And then, of course, the famous Butch Cassidy is uh, said to have buried $15,000 worth of gold coins and cash somewhere between Spokane and Wallace. <laughs> are, 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 are we not somewhere between Spokane and Wallace? We'll get the, we'll get the shovels out soon and the picks and we'll start taking a look. You know, in biblical times, it was common practice for the wealthy to divide their riches, their belongings, into thirds. A third was generally kept in cash so in coin so that they could carry out the business of the day, the trading of the day, you know, purchases, whatever that might be. So a third was kept in, in coin. Another third was usually kept in jewels or in fine stones that could be easily gathered up and taken with them should they have to flee quickly if there were some type of uh, invading force or a threatening enemy coming their way. And then the other third would be buried in the ground to be reclaimed at a later date, if they could remember where they buried the treasure. And if you know me well enough, I even have trouble remembering what tree in the forest I put my trail cam on when I go out every year. It takes me hours to find that thing. It takes me hours. And of course, there were times when, it, when they would bury their treasure and uh, somebody else found it and, and took off with it. But I want you to look at this picture very carefully. When you, we think about this, this issue of buried treasure and, and who is the man and what is the treasure that he seems to be digging up here and read the caption on here that comes from our lesson today. For joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. For joy he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Who is, who is he? Who is the man that is buying the field? Okay, And what is the treasure that he has found and that he is digging up? This comes to us even more clearly through the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2, calling us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Again, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorting its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father. With joy, he did that. With joy, he did this. He gave himself for you and I with joy. You know, the second article of the Apostles' Creed speaks to this beautifully, and it starts with this, if I could say this. As you look at that picture, think of these words. You and I were still dead, buried in our sins. But he, the man Jesus, went out with joy and purchased the field at the cost of everything. At the cost of his own life, he redeemed us. Let's take a look at that second article. It is so beautiful. And we'll get to the words that are highlighted that speak directly to what we're, we're looking at today. So let's uh, speak these words together. Okay. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me a lost and condemned purchase, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent sufferings and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. You see, you and I are his greatest treasure. You and I are his most valued possession. And he has given up everything for us and for our salvation. Absolutely everything. 
the pearl. This is a picture of the world's largest pearl found to date. It's found off the coast of the Philippines, weighs 75 pounds, estimated worth $150, and I have no idea how many pearl necklaces you could make out of it, but it, it would be a bunch. It would be a bunch. Valuable pearl. The most valuable gift of all, are we like the merchant always looking for that perfect priceless pearl? Are we often looking for uh, something of great value, anything that might bring us a little peace and contentment and joy in this crazy world these days? Well, we could go on looking and searching forever and for that one possession or that one passion, and although we might find something that'll fill the void, it would only be temporal, and its effect on us would be short-lived. But here, in the meaning of this parable, the perfect pearl, the perfect the price, the perfect uh, pearl of, of great price is Jesus himself. And you and I are called to give our all to him, our hearts, our mind, and our soul, and to throw off everything else that the world has to offer to follow him and to seek him out at all costs. The kingdom. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells his disciples these four parables that all begin with the kingdom of heaven is like. So the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds. The kingdom of heaven is like a man uh, who, with mustard seed and, and leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like hidden treasure and pearl of great price. And the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea. These words, the kingdom of heaven is like, are repeated and very important. Jesus wants us to know how important the kingdom is and that it is of great value, greater than anything this world can offer, and that it comes to us at a very high cost, purchased and redeemed for us on the cross. And now despite what you might see on TV or hear on the radio, the kingdom is not for sale. And we cannot purchase it. We cannot purchase our salvation by sacrificing all of our goods because the kingdom of this kingdom of immense value has already been paid for. The secrets to the kingdom. We talked about that a little earlier in Matthew 13. Let me read verse 11 for you once again. It says, uh, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So what are the secrets? What are the secrets to the kingdom of heaven? It is what God has done for us in Jesus. It is the identity of who Jesus is, truly and completely God and truly and completely man the world's only Savior and Redeemer, and his mission to live a sinless life and to offer that life as a sacrifice to redeem his people. The meaning of the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price are really essentially the same. They tell us of what Jesus has come here to do, to purchase, to redeem, and to give his all. earthly treasures or heavenly spiritual treasures. So let me ask you a few questions this morning, please. What gets in the way of your kingdom focus these days? What earthly treasures get in the way of your seeking heavenly and spiritual treasures? Whose uh, world or whose kingdom do you live in? Okay. And who or what rules or reigns over your life? And I would submit to you that whoever or whatever it is, that's whose kingdom you live in these days. But you and I are called to do this, to let nothing, to let nothing stand between us and Jesus, between us and his kingdom, not the pursuit of buying our way into the kingdom, or our pursuit of wealth or power 
or a particular ideology or philosophy or to let anything else that we might do or say stand between us and Jesus. So this kingdom, where is this kingdom? Well, look behind me. It's right there. It is right there in the cross. It is right there in the cross. It is right here in the words that have been spoken today, in these words, and in the music that we have sung, okay? And in the liturgy that we speak together each and every Sunday. It is right here at the baptismal font, right at the baptismal font, and it is in our creeds and in our confessions. And it is right here, right now today, here in the bread and the wine and in the forgiveness of sins. The kingdom of heaven is right here, right now. In the parables uh, of both the hidden treasure and the precious pearl, Jesus reinforces this basic truth. Earthly possessions cannot compare to the immense value of God's kingdom. You and I cannot buy our way into the kingdom by sacrificing all our possessions because we inherit the kingdom by grace through faith in Christ, who purchased and redeemed us with his precious blood. You see, the only way to the kingdom is through Jesus. You know these words. You've heard them many times from John 14. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the way to a joy-filled life, folks, is through Jesus. The way to peace in this troubled world is through Jesus. The way to salvation and eternal life is through Jesus. The way to the kingdom of God is through Jesus. But remember this, there's a, there's a caveat here, remember this. This joy-filled life, this peace, this salvation, this eternal life, and the kingdom are not designed to be kept to ourselves, but boldly proclaimed and shared. So it is my prayer for you today that you will share this message, the message of these parables with those who do not see and those who do not hear and that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you will tell them how great the love of Jesus is. You know, even though you and I continue to sin, we stumble and fall, even though we often reject and doubt and put earthly treasures ahead of him and his kingdom, he never stops loving us because we are his precious treasure, his most cherished treasure possession and he has given his all for you and for me amen let us rise now as together we will uh, will be believing confess in the words of the nicene creed I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now go to our God in prayer. By the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to God our Father in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord, making intercession for the church and the world and for all people according to their needs. Today we gather around word and sacrament. Lord, let your word, your saving word, come alive in us today. And through our confession and the good news that because of Christ's death on the cross, we have been forgiven. Prepare our hearts now to receive the gifts of your body and blood. Lord, as you promised. We pray for safe travels and rest and spiritual renewal for Pastor John and Julie and the family as they travel to Europe over these next several weeks, Lord. Grant them a rest and a wonderful time together as they visit old friends and families. Lord, as you promised. Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of your greatness and your goodness to, to us. Grant us your kingdom and your righteousness and grant us believing hearts that we may remain children of your kingdom and keep us faithful until the end of our days. Lord, as you promised. Thanks be to you, O Lord, for choosing us. In your words from John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Thank you for purchasing us from death and from the power of the devil through the death and resurrection and for the choosing us to be your treasure, your greatest possession. Lord, as you promised. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are merciful and through Christ have promised that you will never judge or condemn us, but graciously forgive us our sins and abundantly provide for all of our needs of body and soul. By your Holy Spirit, establish in our hearts a confident faith in your mercy and teach us in turn to be merciful to our neighbor, that we may not judge or condemn others, but willingly forgive all as you have first forgiven us. We pray for those, Lord, who do not know you. Lord, as you promised. Well, God, we pray uh, for all who rule and are in authority. And this day, we pray for our president, for the Senate and the Congress, and also for our governor and state legislators. Give them the gifts of wisdom and discernment and courage that they may lead well, following your will rather than man's will. And grant us the willingness to support them with our prayers and encouragement. Lord, as you promised. Lord God, we pray your blessing upon the servicemen and women who defend us at home and abroad, especially those directly engaged in conflict, as well as those who have answered the call to protect and to serve and to save in our community. Lord, we ask you to keep them all safe and from every harm and evil. Lord, as you promised. Merciful God, that great physician there are are many among us who are suffering from all kinds of illnesses, physical afflictions, as well as those of mind and spirit. So this day we bring before you our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in the need of the touch of your healing hand and the peace and comfort that can come only from you. And so we bring before you this day Ray Morris, Jim and Kathy Frame, Jackie Esch, Julie Muley and Terry Cook, Rita Miller, John Crabtree, Roger Shaw and Robert Press Pitsley, John and Irene Halverson, Monica Renfro and Natalie Fetketter, Daryl Kaiser and Jim and Deb Kaiser, Clyde Yolalto, Robin Anderson and Sandra Bailey, Quentin Taylor and Stacy Dietz, Marge Reich, Steve Van Rossum, Preston Buck, Teresa Dannenberg, Wade McDonald, Elizabeth Warner and Russ Horn, 
Reagan Miney, Pat Wilmering, James Robinson, Doug Wheeler and Anna Rowley, Eileen Albert and Cynthia Spencer, Daniel and Philip Yoskamp, Karen Hartley and Candace Taylor, Sandy Taylor and Christine Cavanaugh, Myra Franks and Rita Miller, Joel McNee and Flo Dunlap, Amy Fetketter and Nita Mason, Bert and Lianne Bertrand, John and Barbara Hensley, Josh and Amanda and the family, the Stack family, the Olin Camp family, and the Frank family. Lord, grant them healing according to your good and gracious will and give them the grace to accept their trials knowing that your grace is sufficient for them. Lord, as you promised. God of comfort, console those who grieve and are mourning the loss of loved ones. And especially this day, Lord, we bring before you the families of baby Murphy, of Chris Alexander, uh, Joan Schenk, uh, Steve West, and Diane Webb, who is the grandmother of uh, Kelsey Kern, who is one of our ELC teachers. Grant all their families peace and comfort and grant them the certain hope of the resurrection to everlasting life through Christ our Lord. All of these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we remember our, uh, our offerings, our tithes, the items that we bring here to church to help with the mission and uh, ministry here at Christ the King, and we're grateful for that. You, many of you still do it online or drop them in the, the boxes as we go up the corridors or have uh, many of them uh, sent directly to us, and very, very grateful for that. And one of, one of the, the things that was very visible, very tangible that we saw this week of, of the impact of your faithful giving was watching all these kids run around here this week. Watching all these kids hearing about Jesus all week long. And that wouldn't be possible without your ties, without your gifts to this ministry. And Friday night would not be possible either with another couple hundred, not just from Christ the King, but those dollars go out into the community. And those people come and they hear and they listen and they join with us. So thank you for your faithfulness and your giving because it has a significant impact on this church and certainly on this community. With that, we sing the offertory. Please stand. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and beneficial that we should at all times and at all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Amen. Come, Amen. Lord Jesus. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Christ is the host of this meal, and he invites his believing, baptized, instructed family members to come to his table at his invitation. For where Christ is truly and physically present with his body and his blood, there also are his gifts of forgiveness and eternal life. Amen. Amen. Seated. Welcome to the Lord's table. We'll receive communion beginning with the front rows and then work over to the back side. So let's begin right here.
everlasting. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true Christian faith until life everlasting. Go with joy and peace. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he has set you free. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, you have given us this foretaste of the feast that's to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. We pray you keep us firm in the one true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage that on the day of his coming, we might together with all of your saints celebrate that marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor, give you his peace. Amen. Please remain standing. Go in peace, everyone, and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone.